I want you to feel of your forearm. Feel up close to the elbow. How it feels different than down close to the wrist. And we've been in this position, which we call pronated. When the hand is turned down, it's pronated. You're going to massage them with this part of your forearm because that's where the thick muscle is. That's where the most support is. That muscle is called your flexor carpi ulnaris. That's the muscle you're going to use. Turn it up on the edge and feel, now you feel this sharp. That bone isn't round. There's a sharp edge to it, right? So if you're doing this, you're, you're hitting them with the sharp edge of your forearm. And you turn it over, there's really no cushion there. There's no cushion. We don't work down on this end. We keep all the pressure stacking the joints here at the elbow because I don't have to use my muscle strength, but if I try to do it down here, I do. So we're always going to keep our elbows at our side and we're going to use our forearm there with the hand in this position. Right? Now the elbow, in the beginning, you're probably not going to use it because we don't use the elbow that much in Swedish. You can, but not that much. You can do Swedish pretty deep. The depth is not what makes the difference between deep tissue and Swedish. It's your intention and what you're doing with it. But in the beginning, you should always use this hand around your elbow to guide it so you know exactly where it is and you're not hitting bones with it. And with this on there, then there's a bigger surface area that they experience and it's not as sharp feeling to them, not as intrusive. And you always leave your hand loose. If you tighten up your hand, you, you tighten up here and that hurts, okay? So the hand has to be loose. And you're still gonna keep it close to your body called stacking the joints. So even if I use my elbow, I don't stand here and go like this. I go like this. So my elbow stays close to my body, right? So if I see you doing this, you, that's wrong. You're not, you're not doing chicken. Then your hands and your elbows come up. You're going to have to stop and drop them. That's not good. Okay. Um, but mainly we use the hands. I don't want you using your thumb a lot. I mean, you can go on YouTube and you can see somebody do an hour and a half of this, their thumb the whole way. First of all, it's not comfortable, and it's not good for you to do it. But you have to use it in such a way that you don't damage it, okay? You've got a joint here, and you have a joint here. And you have to keep them straight, and you have to keep it close to your palm. Joints are compression joints. If you mash them when they're straight, that, they can take it. That's what they're designed for. But they're not designed for pressure coming at them at an angle. They're not designed to withstand that. So if you're constantly working with your elbow here and you're using all of your body weight to force your thumb in, you're damaging that joint. Okay. The wrist, very common for us to get injuries, okay, because we're not using our hands properly. If you bring your hand up past maybe 120, you go like 90 degrees, you have cut off all the space in that little carpal tunnel. Then you add pressure to what you've just done that's a recipe for injury. So we're not going to use our wrist any, any less than 120. So they're always going to be like this. If I want to go into the tissue, instead of standing up here like this, I put my wrist and I come forward. I just flatten my forearms out, right? Just flatten them out. Even if I'm using this hand for support on the table, I'm not like this supporting my work. I'm like this, because that's going to damage my wrist too, just by doing that. So we're going to take care of ourselves. The first thing you're going to learn is to take care of yourself first. Okay? Hands, very important. Never get injured? Huh? Never get injured? Me? Of yeah. course. I've been doing massage for a long time. Of course I have. Took care of myself, though. And I did the right things to heal it up, right? But just over, you know, this wear and tear, honey. That's all it is. But if you do it as correctly as you can, it won't be seriously bad where you can't ever work again. But yeah. But I know what to do, and you're going to know what to do. You're going to, you're going to heed the warning signs. You're not going to ignore them. So many people ignore them. They're typists. They're they on the computer all day. Their hands get sore and tired. They ignore it. Oh, it'll go away. They don't do anything to change the position they're in. They're like this all day long typing. They should not be up that high, right? They should have their wrist resting on something to keep it not past 120. The whole keyboard is not in the right position anyway. You should get one of the ergonomic ones. Have you ever seen those? Mm -hmm. They're down like this. They're not up like this. Your wrist is, re your wrist is resting on a little foam thingy mm -hmm. and the keys are down here. So you're in a little bit of flexion. You're not extended trying to use your fingers. 
The original one is based on a, a typewriter, right? The way the typewriters are, which is the worst thing in the world for your hands. It really is. So if you still have to do it, I would recommend you buy, a, if you don't can't buy anything, roll a washcloth up, put it in front of your keyboard, and rest your hands on the key on the washcloth, okay, when you type. You got to, all right, especially because you're doing massages too. If you spend a lot of time on the computer and you're trying to do massage, you've got to do it ergonomically correct. You know what that word means? Ergonomics, what's it mean? Correct for your movements, for your body mechanics. Uh, least wear and tear, yes. the least, least uh, structure, structural damage, right? Do it properly. Uh, your body's designed to take forces, but you have to do it where they, the forces can pass through the body without damaging the structure. So you have to know a little bit about the structure. And then move accordingly. Move accordingly. So it's not just when you're doing massage. I mean, throughout your day, you got to take care of your wrist. You have to take care of your hand. You have to use them properly, right? So forearms is like this. What is this position called? Pronation. Pronated. This is where you put the pressure, right? Not up here, and it, keep it close to your body. Using your thumb, is that the correct position? No. 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 That the correct position? Yeah. Yes. Or support it. L leave it on your index finger. They don't have to feel this. I can be up where all they feel is my thumb, but my thumb is totally supported if I can do that this way. Now, your tall finger works just like your thumb, and it won't tire, and you can't hurt the joint because you don't have one of these joints there. It's just straight using your finger. So s start using your other fingers too, not just your thumb for everything you're doing. Okay? Does that mean? Hello? That's weird. That's our emergency phone. Okay, never mind. All right, so that's your hands, that's your wrists, that's your forearms. We're going to protect our shoulder by stacking our joints, right? We're not going to try to put pressure on it out like this, not at that angle. It's always like this, okay? You're going to do something called sky hooking. It's a form of body work. It's by Alexander. It's called Alexander Body Work. Uh, he was uh, an actor at the turn of the century when they stood on the stage and they you know, had to do that elocution stuff and they had all those weird moves and they had to project their voice out. And he was constantly losing his voice. He loved being an actor. I think he's in Australia. And he didn't want to give up his career, but he kept losing his voice. So he said, I gotta do something about it. I gotta figure this out. And he kind of locked himself in his apartment and he put mirrors everywhere. And he watched himself. When we go downstairs, you're gonna see I have mirrors on the wall. Like a dance room. Those mirrors are there so you can watch your posture. You're gonna watch your posture, just like a dancer does. You're gonna watch, okay? And he figured out that he was standing weird and crooked and he wasn't allowing his muscles to work properly and that's why his throat was closing up and he wasn't able to speak. So he was very careful and he watched himself and he learned to stand straight. He learned to sit down and stand up with his straight back, right? And not bend his head forward, keep it back. Um, and then he came back and he was doing really good and he looked better on the stage too. You know, his, posi his uh, presence on the stage was much more commanding. So everybody says, what are you doing? I don't know, that's great, you look great. And your voice is great, what are you doing? So he started teaching everybody. And then he got famous and people were coming and he started setting up classes and now you can go and get lessons in Alexander Technique or you can learn how to do it and you can be an Alexander Technique therapist. Uh, but it's all about position, all about position. Now, if you go to a private, one of those private finishing schools, what do they do with the ladies there? What do they, they put a book on their head, right? And they make them walk around. That's Alexander technique. And they make them sit down with the book and stand up with the book and all those movements, right? That's what you need to do. That's the posture you should have. Can you do it? No. Well, then start practicing and get a book and start practicing, okay? When you sit at the di dinner table, how do you sit in the chair to eat your dinner? Slouching. You're slouching over, you got your elbows on the table. What's that doing to your digestion? 
It's also bad for the spine. It's bad for the spine, too. But it's definitely bad for your digestion. Yeah. You know, especially if you have GERD or any problems in here, you're probably going to get choked. You know, it's not good for you at all. You need to sit up. In the chair. Would you sit in there? Yeah. And uh, see if you go to one of these, if you're one of these fancy people to go to the private schools, they teach you all that. They're called finishing schools, right? So you have you have good manners, you have good posture, right? Yeah, but I mean, do it for yourself. You know, nobody has to send you to finishing school. Do it for yourself because you need that. You need that commanding presence. You need a straight spine because of the work you're going to do, and you definitely need to keep your head back. A head weighs nine, ten, twelve pounds. If you took a bowling ball and you held it like this, you could probably hold it for a pretty long time, right? Bring it forward. How long are you going to be able to hold it now? You're going to put a lot of strain on your neck and your back, right? And you see people walk around like this all the time? It's straining their neck and straining their back. So we're going to do something from the Alexander Technique called sky hooking. I want everybody to stand up. You're going to pretend there's a rope attached to your skull and it's there's a great big balloon on the other end of that rope that's holding you up. So just feel that pull up on the top of your head. It's pulling you straight up. Your shoulders automatically dropped, right? And your head came back straight. So that's how you're gonna work. You're always gonna pretend there's a rope on a balloon that's holding you up. It's keeping the gravity from pulling you down, keeping your neck straight. This is extension. When you come back up, the action is called extension, and you elongated your spine. You opened up all those vertebrae. Okay, so we're going to do that. Anybody dive in here, swim in here, dive, learn how to dive? Okay. They tell you to tuck your pelvis, right, before you dive, and then your head goes first and the body will follow. Well, you have to tuck your pelvis when you're doing the work we're doing, because that brings your center of gravity back over where it should be, in the middle of your body. Now, in Eastern philosophy, what do they call that center? We would just say center of gravity. It's a point like S1, S2 in the middle core. of the body. Core? Uh, core? That's American stuff. I don't know. <laughs> it's called, the whole area is called the hara. Everybody, anybody ever heard that word, the hara? And then that one point is called the tantian, that one center. And the first thing they teach you if you go into martial arts is to move from that point. You've got to have the balance, you know. I can't kick my leg over my head and hit somebody and not fall down if I'm not moving from my center. Right. right? Got to be in the center. You need to do that in here too. The perfect exercise for massage therapy is Tai Chi. Anybody do Tai Chi? It's moving the joints in every possible position when the body's moving. Yoga is good, yoga's good, but yoga's static. You're not moving. You're stretching and opening the joints, but you're not doing it with the proper balance, the proper posture. So I would recommend you find somewhere to go and take Tai Chi, take Tai Chi. It'll help you keep your back straight and you'll know how to move properly. Uh, I used to have a poster up here. It's, it's, underneath, you have, yeah. it's underneath here. It's got like, there's like 150 different positions. now. If you go to a martial arts place, it's probably going to be expensive, but there's a lot of places like community centers for cities, things like that, where they have it fairly inexpensive. And uh, just go and learn it. You don't have to keep going like for 10 years you're still in the class. Just learn how to do it and then practice it. You should do it like every day. Uh, we'll have somebody who's going to come in and he'll do a little bit of that. And Qigong. Anybody know what the difference between the two is? Qigong and Tai Chi? Um, well, they both are, but Qigong is more like exercises as well. Tai Chi is just movement. It's stretching and movement and the joints and muscles and stuff like that. But it's not, not energy work and it's not like working the shoulder specifically. And it doesn't include meditation. So Qigong would be a more complete thing to do. It's a little harder to find places where you can go and do Qigong, but that would be the more complete thing to do. But you got to do Tai Chi, if nothing else, because that's going to help you learn how to move, okay? So you've dropped your shoulders, you've elongated your neck, you've tucked your pelvis. That's how you're going to stand, okay? Now, take one foot and put it in your arch. See where the end of your shoe is? I want you to put your foot there. 
Those are so cute. That's, that's, that's not what you're talking guess. about. <laughs> can, you, can you pick up change off the ground with those? <laughs> <laughs> All right, turn your foot like that, 90 degrees, and then put your foot where the end of your shoe was. Okay, that's the width of your shoulders. Believe it or not, that's the you width of your shoulders. Hear. Don't ever stand with your feet any closer together than that. Okay? I don't want to see you standing like this. You got to stand like that. Do this, and then do this. Which way feels more comfortable? Open. Open. Okay? You want to get closer to the table? I'm going to tell you, open your base of support. You're going to go even wider to get closer to the table, right? Now, you're never going to stand with them even to each other. It's always going to be what we call asymmetric stance. Mm -hmm. So one foot is going to be a little bit forward and turned out. That is uh, flexed and laterally rotated. And then every couple of minutes, I'm going to switch my weight and put it over here. Okay? We want to always be switching our weight back and forth. We don't want to ever put it in one spot and leave it for very long because that's tiring. That's tiring. We're always shifting it around. You ever watch elephants? Mm -hmm. Are they ever still? No. Nope. They're constantly shifting their weight. Yeah. Constantly. So if I tell you, you know, <laughs> you're standing still, that means you're doing something wrong. I definitely mean it because you need to keep... That helps you get the balance and the rock to your work, but that protects your body as well. So I'm always moving. I'm always moving. Even, even in this stance, if I'm just doing something, I'm not standing still doing it, right? Now, did you lock your knees? Did you tighten your knees when you did your stance? Anybody tighten their knees? Don't tighten your knees, okay? But don't flex them either. Don't be like this, and don't be locked. It's what we call screw home position. They're open, but they're not bent, okay? That, that brings your body palates back to where it should be too, where you, what your knees are doing, okay? Um, then this stance, if you got room over there, come out a little bit. We'll go downstairs in a minute. This stance is called the archer. An archer. Now in Tai Chi, it's called the mountain climber. Mountain climber. Okay. That's what you're doing. Keep your pelvis tucked. Keep your neck elongated. Your sky hooked. You've touched your pelvis. Now here you're standing in the archer stance. Now watch what happens to my arms. They're they're loose. They just flop at my side and I rock from one knee to the other, back and forward. But I didn't tighten up my upper body. Don't tighten your upper body, leave it loose. Keep your head back, your shoulders, sky hook, and just go back and forth. Okay. So you come forward, and when you rock back, this knee bends. You come forward, and you rock back. Because your center of gravity stays centered when you do that. You're moving, but your weight is in the middle, and you're shifting it forward and back. So if I'm moving, if I'm traveling up and down the body, this is the stance I'm going to be in. Okay. I'm always going to have my, my medial hand, the hand closest to the body, is back and the outside hand is forward. So I'm facing my work. Try it this way. What happened to your back? You twisted it, right? We never twist our back, ever, 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 because that hurts. So i got to face my work. So if I'm doing my archer, okay, this leg is back, this leg is forward. Now, which hand do you think should go forward? Forward leg. Yeah. It's forward. The one in the back. The one in the front. I see back. If I'm walking, it's the opposite. It's the opposite. It's the opposite. It's the opposite. Okay. If you're facing forward. If the is here. Hmm? Where's the table? Yeah. Yeah, where's the table? <laughs> where's your table? <laughs> Here, in here or here? This hand is forward, this hand is back. They're opposite hand and leg, right? right. So it's the opposite. This, hand, this leg is forward, this hand is forward, but, but I'm moving them opposite. Just like when I walk, it's this hand forward, this leg back. Forward, back, okay? Opposite. Not the same side, opposite. That keeps you in the middle. Right? Keeps you in the middle. So when you're walking, you need to learn to walk properly too. We're going to practice on walking. You can use the mirrors downstairs. It should be opposite, 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 opposite. Try that. If it feels weird to you, that means you're not, you haven't been walking right. 
Opposite, opposite arms <laughs> don't pull. <laughs> <forward. laughs> opposite, <laughs> opposite, <laughs> opposite. <laughs> if this leg is is forward, this arm is forward. So opposite, opposite, right? You can make a lot of money if you know how to do this right. And you're real skinny <laughs> and tall. <laughs> Tell me, guys, do you really like girls that look like boys with breasts? Come on. Really? No, you don't. Oh, that's how it was. They're like, they're, uh, they'd be starved to perfection, right? Opposite, opposite, opposite. That keeps your weight proper, okay? So in the horse, it's not going forward and back. All right, do an asymmetric stance. One foot's a little forward and turned out, okay? Now, if I'm working on something right in front of me, like I'm doing petrosage, I'm working on a muscle, I'm going to be in this stance. And it's going to be, you're going to come forward, and you're, gonna, you're still rocking from one leg to the other, but your hands are going forward. Now, you see, I turned my body. I turned my body. So if I need force, it's my whole body giving me force. Gravity is going to be your friend because you're going to push against the ground to give you the force you need. My force is coming up through my legs and into my hand. I'm not pushing down with my muscles. It's the force of my body coming forward and that foot is pushing against the ground. Okay. So push against the ground when you do the horse. When you do the archer, it's the back foot that pushes against the ground. So I want you to start practicing this. Go to Publix and you're walking up and down the aisle. Trying to get us make fun of it. And, still and uh, okay. just smile. <laughs> like the penguins just smile and wave. In case we screw around his ass to leave. Yeah. <laughs> you're screwing, you're screwing, yeah. I guess. And then when you're standing with your car, you can horse. Like the horse. Oh. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's your excuse, yeah. <laughs> that's a really good song. You have to practice, you have to practice outside of your classroom, right? Just make it. This is how we have to do it. So those are the, those are the two, well, the three stances that you're going to use. This one is called asymmetric. Never closer than my shoulders. One leg is forward and turned out a little bit. But I'm still kind of shifting my weight back and forth. I'm not standing still, right? And then what do we call this one? Archer. 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 You still have to be relaxed in your upper body. Don't tighten up. I should see your arm swing when you do this because you're not tightening up. Okay? And then this. Horse. Some people call it something else. I think there's some other word they use now. Martial arts they call it too. Horse stance. Yeah, they call it. See, that's where I'm getting from. What was the first one called? Archer. No. Asymmetric. 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 Now, um, the archer is also known as Tai Chi. In Tai Chi, it's the mountain climber. So if you notice, like that's the mountain climber. That's what they call it. But it's basically the archer stance. Okay. And uh, if my left leg is back, which arm is forward? Right. 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 And you gotta practice that too. You gotta practice it. You gotta practice it. Sneak up on someone and do that. <laughs> now my left hand has to be as strong as my right. What can I do to start getting coordination between my hands? What can I do about this hand? Doing a thing. Start using it. I tried brushing my teeth with my hand. It was so difficult. Well, keep doing it like the twentieth time you've done it, you're gonna be doing a much better job. Oh, I felt so awkward. Much better job. What about writing the field chain? If you get really good, you can you can learn to write. That's a that's a fine motor skill. We're not so interested in the fine motor skills as the gross motor skills. So just learn to coordinate it. At first, it's like it doesn't even belong to you. It doesn't do what you tell it to do at all. And then you'll get better control, right? Because you're you're not going to stand on one side of the table. You got to go back and forth. You got to lead with this one and then lead with that one. And they have to be coordinated. So how do you build that up? You use it. Pull the drawer open with the left hand. Get the silverware out. Stir the pot with the left hand, right? Turn the pages in the book with the left hand. Tear something with the left hand, not just the right. Because you have to. That's, you're learning all this for a, for a reason, right? To learn how to do this. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, sit back down. So that's what we're going to do is use the Alexander technique of sky hooking because the head is very heavy. It needs to be sitting on your shoulders. You need to be standing up and stretching your spine out. 
You don't need to be like this trying to do a massage. You've got to be like this, okay? you got to tuck the pelvis to bring the weight back along the spine. Not, it's called a posterior tilt because here's your hip and you bring it back, right? You bring it back, you tuck it. That straightens you up and that puts the weight of your upper body on the center of gravity so that you can move with the weight balanced, with the weight balanced. So you got to practice that, and you got to practice that. Um, so on here, that's, I'm going to be looking at that. That's one of the things that you're going to be graded on that you know how to do it, body mechanics. The first thing that we do is we learn how to stand and move and protect ourselves before we move on and do anything else. We're going to learn to protect the client, but we're also worried about us. I want to be doing this for a long time. Most, most therapists burn out within how many years? Five is like the max for most of them, right? Because they don't know how to move. They don't move properly. They don't protect themselves. Why don't those therapists, like, why aren't they taught how to take care of themselves? I don't know, because the person that taught them never got taught how to train. Because the school system doesn't require any kind of training to be a teacher. You want to be a teacher, you just have a license for three years and you can teach. You could have not opened an anatomy book in 10 years, but you can go teach anatomy. And you may have never learned anything about body mechanics, but you can go teach it. Doesn't make sense, right? Doesn't make sense. Um, yeah. But anyway, so shifting weight, you know, that means we do like this. We stand asymmetric. We don't stand like this. Keep our elbows down. Power is on the back leg. That's where your power comes from, is the back leg. Stack joints, that means we're over the joints. We're not out like this putting pressure with our arm or our elbow or our wrist, okay? The thumb, we've got to protect it at all times. We don't work with it way down here. We keep it close to the palm or we support it. Or we don't use it for everything. And the wrist is never, this is about 120 degrees. You never want to come down to 90. You never want to do that. Okay? Always keep it flat. If I want to use it without coming up like this, i got to get close to what I'm doing, right? And flatten it out. Or don't use it at all for that. Use a fist. Use a fist, okay? Um, pressure, that comes with you knowing how to do it. Elbows. What's the secret about the hand when you're using your elbow? Relaxed. Relaxed. Do I use the elbow up here? No. no. Keep it by your side. Keep it by your side. Keep it by your side. Um, the, the higher up you come, the more you flex your arm, the pointier your elbow gets. So if you don't want to be like making holes in them, grooves in them, you start off with your arm open a little bit. Now it's not as pointy, right? So if I'm really going maybe on one point, I'm going to come up like this. But it's more comfortable for them the open, more open your elbow is. Now, in order to know where my elbow's going, what can I use as a guide? Your hand. My other hand. Just do it like that, okay? Um, rhythm and pacing and application and overall effectiveness, focus and centering, all of that, it's just like acting. If you watch actors on the screen, the thing that makes you believe that they're really doing whatever they're doing is not, it's the transition point between, like the words and all, the transition, where their eyes are, how they're standing, all of that moving from one to the other. That's what makes it great acting. And the same thing goes for a massage, right? You gotta put those strokes together. I gotta put five or six effleurages together. How do I make them feel connected and smooth? That is sequencing, that's the rhythm. Pacing is you wanna be able to work the whole day, you know? If somebody who doesn't work all the time can show you to do things in massage, and that's only okay if you only do one massage. But you gotta come into work, I used to work 12 hour days, uh, I want to still be given a good massage at the end of the day. I'm not going to wear myself out with that first massage, right? Pacing. Every chance I get, I'm going to lean against the table. Every chance I get, I'm going to sit down on the edge of the table. I'm going to rest and pace myself throughout the day. If I don't have to pick a heavy leg up, <laughs> I'm not going to pick that heavy leg up. I don't have to take the bolster out from under the knees when I turn people. I can leave it on the table, because when they turn over, it's probably in the right place it's supposed to be anyway. 
I only have to do that twice. Put it under there, take it off at the end of the day. I know therapists who've picked that body up five or six times in one massage. Don't do it. You don't have to. Uh, you don't feel you have the strength to do a particular technique for this person, don't do it. I'm going to show you like 10 different ways to do something so you don't always have to do the same thing. Correct, you know, correct body mechanics and do something else. Don't do that. Don't do it that way. Especially if you, everybody's different and you might have something that's a restriction for you that would work for someone else, but you have a bad shoulder so you can't do that that way. That doesn't mean you can't do something that's just as effective. You just have to do it differently, right, than other people. So you have to learn how to do that. Take care of yourself, number one. Um, enhancement, well, <clears throat> the mother hand, if you're not working with both hands, one hand is doing the work, where's the other hand? What's it doing? Relax. What's it usually doing? Relax. Giving you support, right? giving you support. You should be supporting yourself because this also gives you a chance to rock back and forth with your depth. You know, if I'm using my elbow, I'm not holding my hand up here or putting it in my pocket. Where's this hand? On the table. That takes some of the weight off of my body. I'm going in and they say that's a little bit deep. I can rock over onto that hand and take the pressure off. I couldn't do that if my hand isn't on the table. So this is called your mother hand. This is your mother hand, okay? And if you're doing something that's maybe particularly nasty with this side of the body, this one over here is like making them not think about it. Right? You're kind of distracting them with this hand. So I might be doing some nice little effleurage when my elbow's down here. That's a mother hand. It's very su supportive and comforting, right? Um, we can do things called enhancements. Not so much in Swedish one of them, but, but more so in other things. Who's that? Um, <clears throat> things you can say, like if someone, you want them to breathe for you, when they exhale, the body relaxes, you can do deeper work. So you exert on the exhale, just remember that. So you can say, uh, take a nice deep breath for me and blow it out and do it with them to help them relax. Uh, verbal, when you ask them to do something, hopefully they're like in la-la land, right? So I can't just, I gotta do something like verbally. Tap them, tactile cue. I would like for you to turn over onto your back, bring this shoulder to me. Because why do they have to turn towards you? Sure. That's okay, wake them up. <laughs> well, you gotta wake them up and get them off the table. You got somebody else waiting, and they only paid for 50 minutes. Mm -hmm. That was a real extensive nap. <laughs> <laughs> it's up to kind of that's a that's a you know it's your choice if you want to wake them up or not. But I usually don't sleep because at one point they're going to have to move. I'm going to move their leg. I'll move their arm. I'm going to turn. I'll wake them back up. You know. Um, but for some people, like they're just so stressed out, you get them horizontal, they go to sleep. You know, I'm that way, too. I mean, I'm usually so tired. If I lay down, that's it. The massage is wonderful, but I can't really stay awake. Yeah, I can't do it. So it's okay. It's all right. And then at the end, you can just, you know, get them up. Um, so verbal is when we're going to tell them. We want them to turn, tell them what we want them to do. Okay. Try not to use it only when you need to, because Swedish, you're trying to get them into a different mindset, a different wavelength, so that they're relaxed, they're daydreaming, they're not thinking about their surroundings. Therapy work is different. You are engaging with them. You are interacting with them to make sure that you're not hurting them, to get what you need. But Swedish, no. So I see some people asking the person to hold the sheet. How relaxed are you going to be if you're holding the sheet for the whole massage? They turn Why would you need to hold the sheet? For the breast strength, mm -hmm. and if they're on their side, they'll have the person hold the sheet in place. And you know their hands are like this? Yeah. So, yeah. You know they're really relaxed. So don't do that. Don't do that. You are the master of that sheet. You're going to know where it's at at all times. No one is ever going to be exposed. But life is not perfection. So what happens if you screw up? What if you, you slip? What are you going to do? You're going to panic and go, oh, no, I didn't mean to do that. I'm so sorry. 
Expect 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 Oops, sorry. Usually you don't have to say anything. You just put it back where it is and give them a little comforting mother hand and go on with your work. Don't panic, because now they're going to panic. <laughs> and if they think you're stupid enough not to know how to drape that, what else are you going to do wrong? They're paying attention now to you, right? They're paying attention to you. You didn't put the bolster under there? As soon as you notice you didn't put the bolster under there? Don't abruptly stop what you're doing and put it under there. Make it seem like you meant to do that, right? Don't panic. Don't panic, right? But don't think everything's going to go perfectly because <laughs> this is real life. You know, it's not going to go perfect. So it's good to know how to do it when it's not perfect. And if you expect it to be perfect, then you're going to panic when it's not perfect. And you're going to be panicking a lot because life is not perfect. Okay. And you can do the best massage in the whole wide world that you ever did and the person doesn't even register on their screen because they're worried about something else, right? How they react, I really can't take it personal. You can't take it personal. Because if you do, you get ready to do your other massage, now you're all involved in this emotional turmoil and it's going to mess up your next massage. That's it. It's done. Goodbye. Go into the next one with a, with a clean slate. Right? And you never know. One guy, every five minutes he's complaining. I'm just thinking, oh my god, my spa director is going to come in. This is going to be terrible, you know, terrible. And he was in there with uh, his, it was a couple's massage, so the other therapist was, and I was doing everything, she said, you were doing everything right. You were, you were trying to help him, you were being very polite, you never, but he just complained about every single thing I did. He went into the locker after the massage and they asked him how the massage was. It was great, that was probably the best massage I've ever had. <laughs> he just likes to complain, you know? You didn't get in trouble, did you? No, he didn't say, he liked it. He just liked to complain, too. What was he know? complaining about? Oh, that feels bad chance. right there. You're using too much pressure. Oh, oh, are you going to pick my arm up? Don't pick my arm up. But then he said, but then he said it was the best massage. It was the best massage ever. <laughs> he just wanted to be baby. I guess he did. Yeah. It's high maintenance, right? High maintenance. <laughs> and I gave him what he wanted, so he was happy. I thought it was stress relief. Could be. I, mean, I, was, I didn't like the stress I got from him. <laughs> It was okay. But I couldn't let, like, the rest of the day be worried about the guy that complained throughout the massage. Like, four hours later, I'm still worried about the guy that complained. You can't do it that way. You really can't. Can I ask you, uh, like, for us what to expect in your experience doing this uh, and working in the, in the field, what's, like, should we expect to be the most difficult situations to be prepared for, to handle, like, that you've encountered? That, uh... A sexual um, advance. Those are the hardest. That happens often. No. No. Not like you read in the paper. Not like you think. It's a rare occasion. And it's not just between men and women. It's women and women and men and men. And, yeah. You never know. You never know. So you have to have confidence. You have to never be doing anything that gives them the idea that you would welcome in advance. Right? You're not looking down and smiling and you're not touching them inside their thigh. Right. And when they let their hands stray, you don't let them keep it there, right? Uh, when you bend over, your, your chest isn't in their face, um, stuff like that. But sometimes they're just fishing. They're just trying to see how you're going to react to it. And as soon as you let them know that's not what's going to happen, they stop. Other people, it's a mental condition, and they have no control over it. They will keep doing it. You know, they won't stop. And that's the people you got to cut them dead. This is it. Get off the table. We're done here. Don't keep doing it. If you go on out calls, I'll tell you the safest way to do them is make the appointment, find out where you're going to be going. Even if you don't have anybody, as soon as you get there, pretend you're calling someone. I'm calling the office. You call the office. You say you're at whatever address you are. You're starting the massage. Have them call you back at this number in one hour. So that person knows you're not going to be making a call. That they could say, well, she forgot she left, but she didn't call it, she left. They're calling that house. They've got the number. They know you're there. They're calling. And if they don't speak to you on the phone when they call, they're calling the cops. Right? Get some pepper spray. Wear scrubs. Keep it in your pocket. 
taser. Keep it in your pocket. What if you got a taser and taser on the What if you accidentally lean again? Ah, you start spraying, that would be bad. That would be bad. Um, the, the safest way to do a massage as an alcohol is in a hotel because you let the front desk know you're there, you stop, you get a bellman to help you with your table to take it up to the room. When they open the door, they see you and the bellman. The bellman brings the table in. You call down to the front desk, you tell them you're in the room, and that send the bellman back up in an hour with a little cart to get my table. That guy's not gonna do anything because he knows, everybody knows you're there and they're gonna come check on you in an hour, okay? You can make the hotel bring the linens. You don't, don't make the mistake of thinking you have to take linens with you. It's your sheet, you're laying on it, it's your sheet. I'm not taking your oil and germs with me. And I don't want anyone to ever accuse me of bringing a sheet that they caught something from, right? Mm -hmm. You want a massage, I need a flat sheet, I need a pill case, I'll be, you know, whatever you need, it's theirs. You can imagine if you did that, you were an alcohol, and by the end of the day, you have this big laundry bag of dirty linen that you have to go home and now wash, which you shouldn't have to do, right? It's theirs. But a hotel, you can, they can call housekeeping, and they'll send up extra sheets and towels and whatever they need. Okay. It's always best to do work yourself, you know, when you work directly with the client, because then there's no middleman. You get all the money. So you want private clients, but you want to do them safely. I don't like going to someone's house that I don't know them. I've never been there before. I don't feel comfortable. Because I don't know who's behind those closed doors or what's going on. I'd rather be somewhere public, like a hotel, so I know where they are. Or, or have a, a clinic that I own that they come to and then they leave. Much safer. Much safer. Um, the worst thing that ever happened to me uh, is I worked for a, a friend of mine in school. She had an alcohol agency. And she was doing really, really good. She had a lot of hotels in downtown West Palm that were, would call her all the time. And I just did one or two things for her. And then she called me and said, this other girl couldn't come in, but she had some clients that could I fill in for her. I said, sure. And I went to this guy's house, and I thought they had checked him out. I, mean, I assumed that they had. And I go in there, and I set the table up, and he's on the table, and like five minutes into the massage, he just goes, <sighs> and he turns over, and he goes like this on the table, with an erection, and he just lays there like, okay, I'm ready. Sir, you know, this is, did I, did I cause you any discomfort in your back? Is there a reason why you turned over? I really hadn't worked on your back completely. He goes, well, aren't you one of Sharon's girls? <laughs> Hand is on the pepper spray. <laughs> no, sir, I am not one of Sharon's girls, and I'm sorry, but this massage is over. I would appreciate it very much if you would get up off my table so I can leave. He just lays there and looks at me and starts smiling. You go to the door. You don't argue with them. Open the door, stand in the doorway, so you can run if you need to, and tell them you're calling the police. They need to get off your table, leave the room, and allow you to go. Okay? Don't even let them stand there in the room with you. Make them leave the room. And if you threaten them with the police or whatever, they'll, they're going to cooperate. And if they don't, call the police. Don't stand in the doorway. Get outside and call the police. Okay? I'll be on that property. And then he will be arrested for, for um, soliciting. soliciting. Right? He's going to be in trouble. Um, but that's what you do. You don't mess with them. You don't give them a second chance and you don't argue with them and you don't, don't try to make it better. And get paid up front. You know, I'm not going to get paid for that now because he's, you know, he's not going to pay me now. I walk to the door. I got my money. Try to get it back out of my hands. You're not going to get it back. You have to, either they pay in the phone call that you made. That's the best, right? Get the credit card. Or as soon as you get there, you get the money. Don't do it at the end. That doesn't work, okay? Some spas do it like that, but they've got the credit card on file. You pay when you go up to the desk, but they got your money if you don't pay when you go up. But most places you pay up front. Pay up front. Do it if it's a private, if you have a private business, get the money first, right? You wanna know they're serious too about the massage. Right? They can make the appointment like five minutes before you're supposed to show up. I can't do it today. I'm going off now. I'll rebook. Click. 
you just rearranged your whole day to do that massage. Now how are you going to get a client to fill that space? It's kind of bad, right? Bad. Um, so in a spa, they don't really like for therapists to be late or not show up because now they've got to find somebody to cover the massages they have booked you for that day. And nothing makes a spa director see red more than losing money. If they think you're going to cost them money, you're gone. If they think you're going to complain about everything that happens, you're gone. They need to trust you and rely on You want them to rely on you for everything so you get the best schedules and get all the good clients. they got to have somebody reliable, right? And uh, they don't really, if they have to have a reason to let you go, all they have to say is, well, I lost revenue. And corporate will say, okay, gone. Get her out of here. And then what are they going to do? They're going to tell all the other spa directors about you. You go and apply for another job. I know it's not legal, but they do it. They have to protect themselves. They need to know the troublemakers, the problem people. Because the problem people are still going to be going around trying to get jobs in all the spas. And they just leave a trail of disaster behind them people losing money and stuff like that so so we do know before you come uh, and we do a red yellow and green light so if it's red they're not good they may talk to you but they're not hiring you yellow maybe there was a problem you talk to the other people you find out what it was but green is good green is good um, so please be aware of that I don't know if do well, no doc yeah they do. Not as much, but doctors do too. They go to these conventions and they talk to each other. They know who's been hired and what's going on, I think. If you, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you like to know something about the person before you hire them? Yes. If they're gonna be a problem for you or not, you know? Um, yeah. Especially if there's any even hint of a sexual problem. Even the even the slightest you smiled wrong at that person. Because that's the worst thing that can happen to a business, is have that happen in there. And people that like big like big hotels like Marriott, they got deep pockets. Somebody's gonna try to get as much money out of them as they can, right, for anything like that. So be very, very careful. All right, range of motion. Does anybody know what that means? We'll go to lunch at 12. As far as your like, body part can move? Uh, it's movement at a joint. As much movement at a joint as you can give. Um, the goal of massage is to reduce their pain and give them back as much movement as possible. That's our goal. Okay. Each joint can move in a different direction and so many degrees. And here you don't have to learn the degrees that they're moving, but you do have to know what it's called. So the first thing we're going to do is learn how to navigate around the body. What are the actions you're doing called? What is the region called? What plane is that movement taking place in? So if I go like this at the shoulder, that's flexion. Flexion is bending the angle of the joint. Okay? I took angle, I took a degrees away. Here I got a complete circle. I went up a quarter, what is that? 90, I go half, 180, right? It's based on three, this is the only math you need to know a little bit of geometry, just a little bit. Uh, the other math is just knowing how to count money and maybe how to do percentages, like mixing something up and, and that's as bad as it gets. But it's based on geometry, so you got a circle, 360 degrees, and then you start moving within that circle. So if I bring my arm up, I took that much away. And if I go all the way up, I took half of it away, right? So flexing is taking away, and it's movement, it's bending the angle, you're bending the angle. Now the word doesn't sound what, what it should sound like, but putting it back is called extension. But what do you think of when you hear the word extension? Moving you think linear movement. You think straightening something out, right? But it's a word used in geometry. So it doesn't have the same meaning. So you got to not think linear, straight movement. you got to think circles. So flexing is going this way. Putting it back is extension. Bending the angle, flexing. Straightening the angle, extension. OK? 
Okay. I was confused when I was reading that. Yeah. It is confusing at first. Just just remember, I bent it, that's flexing. I bring it back, I give all those angle degrees back to the circle, I'm back to the beginning, it's extension. Now, if I go past the neutral, if I go keep going in extension, mm -hmm. that's called hyperextension. So some of the medical terms you're gonna learn, that's called the suffix of the beginning, and they're gonna have the same meaning wherever you see them. So you're gonna see a lot of hyper and hypos, right? Hyper means it's over normal. Hypo means it's under normal. It's not normal, it's below. Above and below, right? Above and below. Um, so I can keep going back. It's still extension, but it's hyper extension, okay? But I've got, this joint can move in two different ways. It's not just one way. I can also take it away over here. Should I use the same word? Should I call this flexion too? No, because it's not going in the same direction, is it? So they don't use the same word for that. Yeah, you're still moving away from the body, you're still bending the angle, but you're doing it over here, not here. This is called abduction. Ab, ab, and away. Abduction. This is called adduction. So I'm still moving away and coming back, the same, but it's got a different name because it's going in a different direction. Those directions are called planes called a plane. A plane of movement. If I'm going straight, it's called sagittal. The movement in sagittal is flexing and extending. Here's another word that should not be used for what it's used for. I think there's two G's. I'm not sure. There is two G's. There's two G's. All right. Um, from the side, it's called frontal. Why is it called frontal? I hate that. But if I go over, that's called frontal. And in frontal, you do abduction and adduction, right? Now, they intersect, don't they? They intersect. That's the axis of the planes, the axis of the, It's a circle, so it's going to have an axis. So are frontal and abduction the same thing, just different words? The frontal is the name of the direction you're taking. If I'm moving here, it's in the frontal plane. The actions I'm doing, the range of motion I'm performing, is abduction and adduction in that plane. So I know if somebody said do abduction, I know I've got to bring my arm this way, not this way. If they say deflection, I know it's forward because it's the sagittal plane. I'm moving away. I mean, the movement is still taking my arm away from my body, but different direction. It's a different direction. And they intersect. Right? They intersect. So frontal is the side. And it should not say, it should be. Why don't you call it frontal? I don't get yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Is that because of the anatomy uh, the anatomy position of the body? That's why it's frontal. I don't know. If, if something has AL in the end, that means pertaining to. So if something's lateral, it pertains to the side. If something's medial, it pertains to the middle, right? So frontal, it pertain, pertains to whatever frontal, front means, I don't know. But to me, that's just the worst word. I had to really think about that one, because frontal is here, right? It's not here, it's over here. All right, another plane we have is a transverse plane. So my joints can go back and forth, and they can also turn. They can turn. So if I'm turning, it's a rotation, it goes in, it's medial or internal, either way you want to call it. If it goes out, it's external or lateral. Now, you don't have an intersecting plane with the transverse, so we pretend there's one there. What's it turning around? It's a pretend plane. It's called the transverse plane. So you pretend there's a rod going through your shoulders from one end to the other, and you turn on that that point, right? With the trunk, it can do the same thing. I can turn my trunk, and I pretend there's a line going down through the middle that I turn around. And that line we call the longitudinal plane. Just make it up. Longitudinal. So it's still got an intersecting thing that it's moving around, but it's a pretend one. So when I turn, I pretend there's a line there that it turns around. If I turn my body, I pretend there's one going up and down here. But this and this, their actual planes, they do intersect. 
they do intersect, right? Um, then we have variations on those. So the basic movements your body does is flex and extend, abduct and adduct, and rotate. How many movements is that? That's five. Three planes, five movements. Everything else is just a little variation on those five movements. So we said this is pronation. Its opposite would be supination. Supination. If my whole body does it, if I'm laying on my spine, it's supination, supine. If I'm face down, it's pronation or prone. And my hand can do it too. Supinate, pronate, supinate, pronate. Right? But if you'll notice, it's only moving from here down. My elbow is not moving. My wrist is not moving. So it's kind of a half rotation. So we got a different word for it, right? So we don't say lateral and medial rotation. It's a supinating or pronating, because that's a half turn. Your foot can do the same thing. Your foot can turn in and turn out. We have a different word for it. Some books are screwing it up, calling it something else. But if it's facing in, it's inverting. If it's facing out, it's everting. But it's turning around that point. It's a movement in a circle around that point, right? So everything else your body does, it's just a variation of those five basic moves. Flex and extend, abduct and adduct, and rotate. Now the foot isn't a straight on joint like the wrist. It's bent out at an angle. So your foot goes up and down instead of back and forth, right? So if I go up like this on my toes, I lift my heel off the ground. What do you think that's called? Plantar flexion. Very good, plantar flexion. Somebody already knows this. And then if I tap my toes instead, Dorsiflexion. flexion. What does dorsi mean? Back. The back. The back. Now, don't ask me why. It's another one of the frontal question. Why is the top of my foot the dorsum? I don't know, but it is. This is the dorsum of the hand. This is the palm. That's the dorsum. That's the plantar surface, okay? It's dorsiflexing. You don't have an extension. It's flexing either way. But flexing, lifting the heel, or flexing, lifting the toes, okay? Now when we learn the muscles, the muscles are gonna be called flexors and extensors. The muscles here, what do you think are gonna be called? Flexors or extensors? Extensors. Very good. Back there, flexors. Not a, there's not a plantar flexor, the toe, on, it's just flexors and extensors. But those are just little variations, okay? Now your wrist can do something that's a variation too, all right, you can wave like the queen. So I can flex and extend and wave, or I can wave like the queen. This can be called abduction and adduction, but the more correct term would be deviating. I'm deviating from neutral. If it's this way, it's named for the bone, so I'm radially devi deviating. If it's over here, it's ulnar deviating. Now, if you're standing like this in anatomical position, they would say that's what? Adduction, I'm going towards the body, and this would be abduction. But I can do that wherever. I don't have to be in anatomical position. So doctors usually don't use that. They use the deviation words because it's more accurate. Okay? More accurate. But your wrist can also do this, which is a little circle thing. So if you combine all of those movements, all five of them at once, it's called circumduction. So if I do this with my arm, I'll make a big cone movement from the point right here. That's not a flexing or extending. It's not just one, it's all five at once. So that's called circumduction. Does that apply to your feet too when you mm -hmm. rotate your ankle? Mm -hmm. yeah. So you got little variations. You got the pronating and supinating. It's just a, a smaller version of rotation, right? You got flexion and extension down here, but because it's being out at a 90 degree angle, it's called something different. It's still moving the foot and the heel up and down, right? And now you got this funny little bone back here. Anybody know what that funny little bone's called? Scapula. Your scapula. Now, it's a pretend joint. It's what we call a pseudo joint. There's muscle between the two bones, and there's no actual capsule or anything connecting them together. But it still moves, so it still has actions. It still does. If I do this, what did my scapula do? Not my arm, what did my scapula do? It went up, 
and what will we call that? Elevation. If it goes down, depression. So my scapula doesn't move in a circle like all my other joints do. It moves plane in a plane a planar movement. It's flat, right? So it slides up and down, elevates, depresses. What if I did that? Protraction. Protraction. It moves forward. The opposite. Retraction. Retraction. So it can go up and down. It can come forward and back. If I move my shoulder past 90, it has to move to get out of the way. So if I keep going up to raise my hand, the scapula went like that, like a seesaw. Right? It's going to go up and down. Upwardly rotated for me to raise my hand. If I put it back, what do you think that's called? Downward, right? Up or downward. So movements, I'm going to give you a big handout on all this. Movements are just what's happening at the joint, but we have to use different words for it because it's doing it in different directions. But what are the five movements that are the basic movements of the body? Flexion. Abduction. What goes with flexion? Extension. Abduction. What goes with abduction? Abduction. And rotation. And then everything else is just a combination or variation of those five. That's all it is. So that's range of motion. Now, we're going to do this with them on the table. We're going to range their neck, we're going to range their shoulder, we're going to move their scapula, we're going to move their hip and their leg and their knee and their foot and their toes with them on the table. So we have to know how to hold that limb properly, especially if it's a big leg, right? Got to stand correctly, got to lift correctly to move them all around. And you have to be safe. So which of those joints do you think you have to be the safest with? Your shoulder. Those right there, range of motion. Which one do you think you have to be the careful, be very careful with? The wrist. The neck, right? That's the most vulnerable place on their body. So whenever I move somebody around on the table, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to secure the neck. Make sure that that's okay. So if I ask them to turn over, and look on YouTube, the first thing they do is fix the bolster. Well, that's not the most important thing for that person on the table is that their foot is supported properly. You go to the head and you fix the head first, okay? Make sure that they're okay with the neck before you go anywhere else. And you be more careful with the neck than any of the other joints because it's the most vulnerable part of the body. Right? And people are really kind of scared when you're grabbing their neck and moving all, all around. You gotta, you gotta get their trust and their confidence. So you can't be up there all nervous Nelly You've got their head in their hands, right? You don't know what you're doing with the head, but their eyes start peeling up. They start wondering what you're doing, too. So that's the most vulnerable, right? But we're going to do all this to them. When you're doing therapy, you might ask them to do it, and you engage them in the movement. But you shouldn't ask them to do this in a Swedish. That's your job. They should be totally relaxed, right? Do you, how many's gotten a massage in here? Did they pick your arm up, pick your leg up, move your joints all around? Yes. A little bit, a lot, but a lot, a lot. That's good because most people don't. You, you see them and they don't know how to drape because all they do is push the drape over and work on the leg and the leg never moves off the table, so they don't have to even try to drape it. But the joint is just as important as the muscle. And you as a therapist, if you ignore the joint, you only did half the work, half the job. You really should think about, as soon as you touch them, you put a little tension on them, because that's called distraction in the joint. And that opens it up, and that's good for it. And then push against it, but you need to move them. Joints don't have a blood supply. They're what we call avascular. How things get in and out is with movement. And if I'm put, pumping and moving that joint all around, I'm helping it, I'm improving its function. So if all I did was work the muscles around the knee and I didn't do anything about the knee, I really didn't improve their leg too much, did I? So we're gonna move them all around. Safely, so we don't get hurt, we don't use the weight and get hurt with the weight. But we're gonna definitely do that. Um, endangerment sites are places on the body, I'm just going down the list, on the body where we have to be careful because there's structures that aren't protected by a thick layer of muscle. Anybody know where your kidneys are? Where's your kidneys? 
Yeah. Do I have to be careful of your kidneys? Yes. Yes, because why? Yeah. If, I, if I don't have to be careful right above it, but I have to be careful right there, there's something about the way the kidneys are that makes them vulnerable. Retro, 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 retro retroperitoneal. This is a design flaw as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but the kidneys are not inside the cavity. They're behind it. So they're not protected by that thick membrane wall or the muscles. They're right underneath that. So if you hit somebody really hard right there, you, you could hurt them. Right? You can still effleurage and you can still do all of your muscle work and all that kind of stuff. But don't be digging your elbow into their kidney. And certainly don't be hitting them there with, with a stroke. You know, you have to be careful right there. Other places, like here, if there's nothing there to protect what's underneath, which is uh, nerves, arteries, and veins, and lymph nodes, too. So I really can't be doing a bunch of digging around here, right? I can still stroke over it, but I have to be careful, because there's nothing to protect what's underneath. Now, I want you to pick your arm up, and if you'll notice right here, between your biceps and your triceps, there's kind of like a little groove. Put your fingers in there and press. Mm -hmm. Ow. I'm going to go straight to the bottom. Ow. Mm -hmm. You're right on top of the musculocutaneous nerve. There's nothing to protect it. It's, the biceps muscle doesn't cover it, and the triceps muscle doesn't cover it. It's called the medial brachial endangerment site. So when I pick your arm up off the table, can I just grab it right there and pick it up? <laughs> I gotta be careful and I gotta know not to put my fingers in and hold that arm right there, right? I gotta put them somewhere else. So I need to know where they are. That's pretty obvious. That one maybe is not so obvious, right? In the neck, you wanna stay on the thick muscles. The front, turn your head. This muscle that pops out is called the SCM. Very good. I wanna say everybody know that one. I don't know, it's, it's a word this long, but everybody nice knows it. So cool. It's so cool, it is cool. But you don't want to write it, so just say SEM. <laughs> when you turn your head, it is the dividing line between this little space where there's no muscle and the front. So there's, the front is two together. So you got a triangle here and you got a triangle behind it. This is the anterior triangle and this is the posterior triangle. There are arteries, veins, nerves, and lymph nodes in there that you don't want to be pushing on. So when I'm working on the neck, I'm going to stay where I feel thick muscle. Don't be digging your fingers in right there. <laughs> And the only reason you need to be up here is if you're doing something very specific to those muscles, maybe cranial sacral, you and me, we're going to effrage, and that's it. Here, okay? You want to work on the SEM, but you don't want to work on that space behind it, and you don't want to work on this space here. Carotid artery, right? Yeah. Comes to mind, right? And nerves and everything else, you have to be protective of that. So that's what an endangerment site is. It's just somewhere where you have to be careful not put a lot of pressure, know what, what kind of strokes to use. Um, feet and hands really don't have them. You know, you can just mash and press away on the feet and hands. They like it. Regions is how we're going to learn how to get around the body. I got some handouts for you. It's in the, the trail guide book, okay? This is medical terminology. This is the hardest thing about what we have to learn to do is what, what the words are, what the language we're going to use. Um, we don't say just hold them on the front of the body right off to the edge of the rib cage underneath it. No, you gotta be specific and say what that region is, what that region is, okay? So the body's divided up. Think of it this way, it's a map. If I wanna look at the United States of America, I can get a map of the United States of America. Anterior, posterior, dorsal and uh, ventral, the whole thing, or appendicular and axial. That's the whole thing. I'm dividing up the whole thing. It's a map, the United States. I want to be a little more specific, then I can get a map of the southeastern United States, right? Then I want to be a little more specific, Florida, a little more specific, Broward County, a little more specific, Coconut Creek, Cross Street, Coconut Creek Boulevard, in the campus itself, the building, the room. I can go smaller and smaller and smaller. The smallest area is included in that great big huge map, right? It's part, it's part of it. But if I'm going to talk about one specific area, I just zoom in on it. And unfortunately, they all have names. 
Most of them are for the bones they're on, you know, it's getting kind of complicated. But you start with the whole picture, the whole body, and then you go smaller and smaller and smaller. So this is facial, the whole thing. The whole thing is skull, right? Then I can say cranial and facial. Then I can say one area, one region. And if there's more than something in that region, I can just get smaller, smaller, smaller. So what do you think your eyes called? The, the hole in the, this whole thing right here. No, this whole thing right here, the region. Ocular, mm -hmm. ocular, right? This is what? Nasal, like nasal. The mouth, the word for mouth is oris, oris, or os, when you're talking about medicine, they say take it by mouth, os. But os is also bone, so I kind of like don't try to use it, the same thing. But, uh, yeah. So they all have a name. The cheek is the bucca, so the muscle is the buccinator. Cheek, right? Don't ask me why, but this is mental. <laughs> You'll never forget it because it's like, why is that called mental? But it is, right? It's pertaining to something, so the AL tells me i got to look up mint to know what it means. Um, but that's how we go. We go big and we get smaller and smaller. Those are regions. Your abdomen is divided up into nine. It's like a tic-tac-toe thing. We don't really need to be that specific in massage, so we just say quadrants. How many sections are in a quadrant? Because quad means four. four. So you got an upper right and a lower right. You got an upper left and a lower left. Now, if you're looking at it more medically, there's going to be three, three, three. The one in the middle where your navel is, what do you think that one's called? Umbilicus. Umbilicus, right? Hypochondrial. Not a hypochondriac. Hypochondrial. Because hypo means what? Below. Chondros means what? Cartilage. So the region that's below the cartilage of the ribs is the hypochondrial region. Okay. What's your stomach? Gastro? Mm -hmm. So if I said something was a hypogastric region, where are you going to look? The lower stomach. Below the umbilical, the lower stomach, right? Now these little sections here have two names. It's either inguinal or, um, what's the other one? Iliac or something like that. Tell you something that, that happened to me once is you know, at the rehab where I worked, it was the greatest place, I swear, such a learning environment. At the time I hated it, but now I can look back. And, but once a week we'd have to get up and get in there like 7.30 in the morning before the clients came in. And they would have doctors in the area come in and do a little lecture for us, talk about the latest hip replacement stuff or whatever's going on. And then the, play, the guy I worked for would make us stand up and do little talks for the doctors. And I was doing something about leg movements and in the gym, and I kept saying iguana <laughs> instead of inguinal. And I'm thinking inguinal, but that's not what I'm saying. And everybody's going, <laughs> nobody, you know, like, nobody told me that I was saying it wrong until afterwards, and I felt like such an idiot. You ever done that? Said something that totally not what you were thinking at all? And then it gets kind of stuck in your mind, and it's always going to be iguana from now on. It's always going to be iguana. <laughs> the doctor thought it was funny, thank God. But he knew I didn't know what I was talking about anyway, so I didn't have to be here. Um, and then positional terms is what we were just talking about. Supine, prone. What position is your body in? Sideline, which is lateral and recumbent. Okay. Uh, directional terms. If you're moving lateral, which direction are you going? away from the midline, yeah. if you're medially, towards, Absolutely. superior, Absolutely. you're going up, inferior, going you're going down. down, directional terms, right? Directional terms, which, which direction are you taking? Now, it gets kind of funky with the arms and the legs because you're going to have a directional term that relates to where it attaches. Yeah. So something can be proximal or distal. or distal. All that means is proximal is it's closer to its attachment, distal would be it's further away. We don't talk about that on the trunk, we say superior and inferior. But on an arm and a leg, you're going to say proximal and distal. Directional, which way are you going? What's the direction you're taking? If I were moving cephal word, what do you think the word cephal means? C-E-P-H-A-L. It's got something to do with the head, right? So if I'm moving cephal word, which way am I going? 
Towards the head. You would say superior, but you could also say cephalward. So if I ask you to do your massage stroke with the pressure in a cephalward direction, you're, you're pushing the fluids up, right? How about if I said caudal? Down. You're going down. We say towards the feet, but the word actually means towards the tail, but it means towards the feet. So we would use those words. We could also use the words in pressure, centrifugal and centripetal. Now we're talking about the heart. Are you going towards the heart or away from the heart? Most of our work is which way? Which way do we want to push the fluid? Towards the heart, right? Towards the heart. So most of your work is going to be centripetal in direction. But sometimes, if you got somebody with low blood pressure, or if it's an athlete about to go out on the racetrack, you don't want to be pushing it in, you want to be pushing it out into the muscles. Then that would be centrifugal. That's just telling you the direction, but you're mainly talking about your movement that you're using for pressure. You would use those words. Those words. So there's words about position, about where you're at and what you're doing, and which way you're moving, right? Energy points. Now, there's an awful lot of them. Um, you're only going to have to learn about 20 of them in here, maybe 25 at the most. If you're studying classical acupuncture, there's 365 of them, so you've got, you're getting off easy. At first, we don't really are specific with our work. We're, not, we're kind of general, but then when we learn a little bit more, we're going to be more specific with where do I press, because I want to hit that point, right? General at first, but then if I want to hit uh, triple warm with five, I know it's right there, and that's why I hit. This one is a really good point. You should always use it. It's an overall relaxing point, so you need to know where that is, right? Only 20 of them. And the meridians. There's 12 of them. They're bilateral. You got two of them, except the ones in the middle. But all of them are two. You got two kidneys, two heart. You need to know those and the direction that they go. Because we're going to apply that when we do shiatsu, and we're going to apply that when we do a meridian massage. So we're going to learn how one flows into the other. Because what's happening throughout the day, the Chinese clock is 24 hours in a day, and the energy is in each of those meridians for two hours, and it's out of the meridian completely the opposite at some point in that time frame. So you want to start at the beginning of the day, which is 3 to 5, that's long. So what do the swamis all tell you to do? When do you get up and do your breathing exercises? Sunrise. At dawn, right, right before dawn, right? Because that's when it's the most powerful. If I had a lung problem and I need, needed surgery, I would really kind of ask them, uh, can we schedule that at 4 o'clock in the morning? Who's going to do that? They don't care. But that's when it should be done, right? And then it goes around the clock. So if I'm going to do a meridian massage with you, I need to know this, this meridian starts here and it goes here. The next one starts here and goes here. The next one starts here and comes here. And what it's doing all day long, it takes two yin. Yin are the ones that are going up. Yangs are the ones that are coming down. So all day long, it's flowing like this. And they, they're called tides because that's exactly what it's doing. They're the tides, right? Nutrient tides going up and down. If you ever go up to Orlando early in the morning, don't the, the, the orange grove smell wonderful? It's heavenly, right? You come back by that same grove at 6 o'clock that night, you don't smell anything. Because where's the essential oil? Where's the, where's the energy? In the morning, it's up, right? And in the evening, it's gone. It's somewhere else. Your body's doing the same thing. You're almost all water, so why wouldn't you be affected by tides? And it's going to cycle. So it's going to start with the lung, which is from the face, because it's going up. This is, this is Western anatomical. This is Eastern anatomical. When I say something is going down, you got to picture them standing like this. Not like this. This isn't down. This is down. From the sun, yang comes this way. From the earth, yin comes this way. But standing like this, okay? It takes two yens to get all the way up, and it takes two yangs to get all the way down. And what it's doing all day long is going up and down, in three cycles of four meridians each. Four meridians each. So it goes from the lung, which is right here, down to the thumb, up to the thumb, I should say, because it's the end. And then large intestine is going to come back. So trunk, 
to hand, hand to face, face to feet, feet to trunk. That's one cycle. I came back to the point where I started, right? the, the trunk. The next cycle is going to go trunk to hand, hand to face, face to feet, feet to trunk. Can it take two hours? In each one. And if you've got four meridians, how much time is that? Eight, right? Um, and if you look at it, do you know what the caduceus is? Anybody know what the caduceus is? The symbol of medicine, the little the little thing oh, with the little, yeah. like this, right? Yeah. And it's got the snake. Yeah. Do you know what that's a representation of? The energy flow through the body. All right, here's your head, all right? Chest to hand, hand to face, face to foot, foot to chest. On either side, there's the shape. The snake is kundalini energy. It travels up the spine, opening chakras. So that one little symbol has got so much meaning to it about how the body functions. It's all in that symbol. That's why 2,000 years later, we still use it. You know, we don't believe in all that crap anymore, right, the, the gods, of, but we just kind of hedge our bets, put it on everything. It's still the symbol for medicine. And the, the stalk part is also the representation for Hermes, who is the messenger who brings the, the energy or the, the healing from the gods, right? Just in case, I mean, it might still work. We don't know, so we want to make sure. You write a prescription, it still has this on it, doesn't it? Yeah. What does that mean? I don't know. That's the symbol for Jupiter, uh -huh. the god of medicine. Yeah. Rome, Rome so we want to make sure it works, right? We're going to like give, give it the blessing. You don't write a prescription without that on there. I mean, we don't believe that anymore, do we? But we still put it on there just in case. We're still using calendar, that's a real it might still work, so we want to make sure. Okay, so you guys go have lunch. Um, today you can have an hour because it's new and your your first time here. You can take an hour. Okay. Kind of ride around and see where everything is. If you keep going back that way, if you take the little driveway, there's a little Indian restaurant in that Motel Six or whatever it is there. It's not that bad. It's not real good. It's not that bad. And then on down at the Atlantic is a. Um, what is it? Churches? Chicken? And then if you go on the corner, you're getting kind of far away. But that's not that far. And then there's McDonald's right on the corner. And then just past that is Wendy's. Going that way, you've got going that way, you've got Bella Roma. You have a subway. Going that way. And up on the corner, there's a couple of little restaurants in those plazas there. But don't try to go any further than that today. All right, it's 10 after 12. Once you give you back, I'll give you an hour. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. See, you can do that. I'll do that. Yeah. Is the bookstore open? Yeah. 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 Drive all the way around to the back. Big circle. All right. Okay. Thank you. Are you seeing this one? If everybody leaves, I'll walk it. If anybody's going to stay, but I'm going to go to hunt too. So. Can you use a microphone? Of course. If you are, if you are going to be the last person out the door, please text me and tell me that you locked the door. All you got to do to lock the door is push that button in and close it. But 90% of the time, there's at least one person there, right? She's going to be our guard. Your assistant coach. Our dark knight. I think what we'll do today is we'll do our little medical history thing so we can go downstairs and work on each other. Sounds good. <laughs> Usually it's all important how many tricks and things we do. We can make a little aromatherapy bag and sell them. We can do a health fair. 
can sell the, you know, if you know how to make lip balm or whatever, we can sell things. But usually what we do is we do chair massage and charge no, like no, an hour I'm just minute. saying, like, um, by the end, as you said, you like buy a little thing for everyone. How much do you usually end up having to spend? Well, on, on average, we usually have three or four hundred dollars at the end of the year. Just for, like, for everyone? Yeah, for everyone. Like I said, I can't give it to you individually. I have to spread it no, across no, everybody. No, no. I know. So. I was just thinking, how much? Because then, what can you? Well, then we're going to decide. We're going to decide what you want. You get to pick what you want. I know you can get like a, a massage table for like fifty bucks. Something. I wouldn't buy a massage table for fifty dollars. I would. Really. Just remember the cheaper ones that you see in like Costco and stuff like that. No, they're I'm very Costco. heavy. They're, they're, like they're the great warehouse. tables. It's great if you're never going to be carrying it around. If you're putting it in the room and leave it, that's fine. But they're not really.